This is a message recorded at Kingdom City Conference 2018. Pastor Jedediah and his wife Amber have done amazing work at Missions Me that are now impacting and reaching the nations. He's also one of the most passionate communicators of our generation, and this message is sure to leave you inspired to change your world. If you'd like to see more content like this, do let us know by leaving a comment below. Share this video with your friends and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. We're praying that this message will encourage you and leave you empowered to do amazing things. Can we just give Jesus a shout of praise? Come on, if you got a reason to be thankful, to be grateful. We're going to be doing that for eternity. How many, uh, and the lights are out, how many would, could just say, hey, there's a physical miracle that took place? Just love to honor God with all the actual miracles that took place. So many hands. Take a look around, guys. Look all the way to the back. So many, so many hands to count all the miracles that God, who said God doesn't still do miracles, huh? How many last night had your best night of sleep, that you've been struggling with sleep, you haven't been able to sleep? Put your hands up high quickly. Look at all these hands. Best night, put them up high. High, high. Hands all over, hands all over the back. Come on. Come on. Come on, let's just. Hey. God just loves you, so proud of you. God's so proud of you, Kingdom City, Perth. Smiling, we were just in the back room and um, you just need to, obviously we're trying to get, we're, we're trying to help you get what God's doing. We are saying goodbye to Dr. Maiden and we're sitting there talking with Pastor Mark and Jemima and just talking about how he said these words, he goes, I, I just can't remember a conference. I can't remember a moment. You got to think how long that guy's ministered. I'm a little younger. I just got saved a few weeks ago, but <laughs> like for real. And he's like, I just can't remember a moment like this in ministry where I've just seen such an outpouring of the prophetic. I, I've never seen such an incredible energy and atmosphere in the spirit starting from Malaysia. This, these are seasoned spiritual veterans that have a reference point for ministry all over the world that stood at Pensacola and, you know, have been up to Bethel and Reading. And we've just been in all these incredible, amazing environments, have been in incredible global conferences. I've been in the largest churches in many nations, church in Lima, God's doing a move of God, the largest church, 110,000 people. It's insane. And, we, and as we looked for a reference point for this, we could not find one. Because God's not doing the next thing, he's doing a new thing. And if you look at the vehicles on the planet right now that God's ordaining, and you've had 12, it's so similar to One Nation One Day, you've had 12 years of the glance of God, and you've just entered into the breath of God. It's a different rhythm, it's a different pace, there's an inhale, there's an exhale, there's a cadence. That means something's poured out and poured in every day. And this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. Thank you for those of you that have been serving so faithfully for 12 years. Thank you for the few guys that were in the room 12 years ago. Every one of you that came in four months ago, four years ago, eight years ago, that have just been in the room, that have just been faithful, that have just been tithing, that have just been obedient. Thank you. We, thank you. Thank you. So, Father God, we just, we know you saved the best wine for last. Yeah. Which means you have something you want to pour out in these next few minutes we have together. That out of all you've done, somehow you still have something better. So, God, we surrender ourselves, our agendas, our ideas, these moments. 
So many came in here looking for something specific, and God's just trying to give you something different. We set aside the timelines. We set aside the, the framework in which we think our miracle can take place. And we just say yes. The response of this house has just been a yes. However, whenever, through whoever, we give you permission to release the complete capacity of your glory in this place. We give you permission to show up, to show off. Holy Spirit, begin to move through hearts right now. I thank you that it's so much more than the words that are shared today. It's a mandate you've brought to a house. God, even though I'm not speaking on that subject, I pray as I communicate, marriages would be restored. I just thank you, God, the reports of divorce. I see divorce papers being torn up. God, what an honor it is to know you, to serve you, and to be a vessel that can speak into this house. God, I'm humbled. so good. God, I pray, Lord, that not one person would leave here confused about your goodness. God, not one person would leave here questioning your mercy. God, not one person, not one person would leave here without a complete revelation of who you are and who they are in you. That we would leave clear on our identity in this new reality. And I celebrate this room, God, because you've given everybody in this room a promotion. Everyone that's in, under the authority of this house and divine alignment has been promoted. Their home has been promoted. Their call has been promoted. Their businesses has been promoted. Their future has been promoted. We all just got upgrades without paying the fee. Jesus' name. Man, it's so heavy in here. Can you hug on somebody? Love on somebody? Can we get that move farther? Oh. I mean, who starts crying? I'm already a wreck. This is just... Are you ready? Come on, tell your neighbor I'm ready. Tell your least favorite neighbor I'm ready. Tell, tell your neighbor this session's for me. Come on, own it. Tell them this session's for me. Anything that's left, God's about to do. Are you with me? It's been such an honor and a privilege to spend so many days with best friends. It's not just a covenant relationship. It's it's a, it's a best friendship. There's few people on the planet I love as much as these leaders. And how many are so thankful and grateful for this diverse, unique, anointed, apostolic and prophetic union that was shared over a cup of coffee? You know, any agreement made over coffee is anointed. That was the, you've missed the secret ingredient to Kingdom City. It's coffee. <laughs> and all the legal addiction people, come on, you got a big loud, amen. So true. Hey, can we give it up for every volunteer, everybody that's wearing a badge? Come on, everyone that's been serving the production team, the worship team, front of house, behind the screens. Come on, can we just thank them for creating a space for us to encounter God? They've served so well. We love you. We honor you, the cameraman. Come on. I encourage you, thank somebody on your way out. Obviously, conference doesn't end today. It ends tomorrow night. I got three more sessions tomorrow. Um, so I'm just excited to just, it will be a continuation of the conference for me. I encourage you, get everybody you know to the church you go to. Whatever campus you're at, I know we got the two main campuses can, you know, brought together, three services. Please bring somebody. 
I'm just telling you, bring, invite somebody. If you don't invite somebody, you've missed the whole point of this thing. Bring somebody, take somebody on the journey with you. Bring that person that you thought would never go to church, would never get saved. I'm telling you, tomorrow people will get saved. That's right, amen. There'll be outrageous salvations. Yes, it will. You're shouting me down from the front with your microphone, Pastor Mark. Just, amen, yes. Are we preaching back? I'm just saying amen. <laughs> Is this a duel? Yeah, awesome. Oh, my God. Amen. <laughs> Please turn his mic off. This is dangerous. <laughs> so, like. Is that you, Lord? No, it's not. It's, a, it's an Indian man who's grabbed the... It's, it's joking. God, don't smite me. Um, but I encourage you, thank somebody on the way out. You know, thank, especially if you have kids, because we've been here long, right, with no break. Some of you have, like, just dropped off kids and you know there's a conference. You're like, free child care. Hello. So just, just thank somebody, please. Hug on somebody. There's, there's so many people serving faithfully and don't want them to go unnoticed or unrecognized. And they've provided an incredible space um, for God to do what he's been doing. And I feel like I'm going to have a new anointing. I actually have a Michael Maiden towel up here. So if we get really prophetic. How many were thankful for the gifts of Dr. Maiden and Dr. Sammy Rodriguez? And I would say this again. I don't know when I've said it or where I've said it. We've been in a conference for like 24 days right now. It feels like it's been, you know that your church is crazy. No one holds back-to-back -back conferences without one day of break in two different countries. There was church on Sunday, conference Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We still have Sunday. Come on, somebody. I feel like that is revival. <clears throat> If you got your Bibles, turn with me. If we could, if I could just get some stage help. I'm sorry, these, these baskets are going to drive me crazy. If I could just get two people, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do, and then we'll make sense of our props up on the stage. I'll set them up. Turn with me with John chapter 2. And while you're turning there, hey, if we could just yank that to you and then just bring those together there. That would be awesome. Just put them right together. Perfect. Thank you for, for our volunteers making this happen. <clears throat> I've said this before, and I just want to say this again. This is not common. What's happening here, what you've experienced in, what you've entered into, what we've seen over these last few days as I've been texting back home and telling my friends I've never been in such a prophetic download from heaven. This has been an outpouring. I really feel like if you were to say what is a 21st century outpouring, what would be a 21st century upper room moment, this would be it. That what's been happening these last few days and what's been happening in your church and through your leaders and through your lives, this is not common. There's nothing about that, that that's common. Now, it's familiar right? You're familiar with God moving. You're familiar. Look at all the miracles. Look at all the people that have experienced a breakthrough. Look at all the prophetic words. We're familiar with it. We're familiar with worship. We're familiar with God's grace. We're familiar with God's mercy. We're familiar with this in incredible divine exchange of, you know, our past for his promise, our sin, for our salvation. Like we're familiar, we're, we're, we're familiar with it, but don't let what's familiar become common. Because I'm familiar with being married 13 years this month, and I'm familiar with having kids, and I'm f familiar with the relationship that I have with my wife, but there's nothing common about it. It's extravagant. It's unusual. You need to know that the, the tragedy would be if you let what's become familiar become common. There's nothing common about God's grace. There's nothing common about God's goodness. There's nothing common about his sacrifice. There's nothing common about the presence. There's nothing common about, are you hearing me this morning? There's nothing common about what God is doing here at Kingdom City. Amen? Amen? John chapter 2. And I would encourage you, not just for today's message, but as you leave here, I was, had an incredible time with a businessman. Just want to get a few things out of the way, and then we're going to get into this word. If you were to say, what would be next for me, Jedediah, besides telling everyone what's happening and bringing them all and expediting the return of Christ? If you were to say, what's, what's next for me? I would take every word you've had, heard said over this house, and I would write it down, and then begin to align my life with what's been released. If you think about the word that's been said, a hundred million dollars and a hundred churches and, you know, a continent of Asia been given to you and a million people in attendance and stadiums being filled. Are you hearing me? Like, I would begin to write every one of these words down. If this is your church and you're in covenant with this house and you're under the authority and you're a part of this vision, and I would make that vision plain and then begin to align my life to what God said. Because God's promises are not looking for our assessment, they're looking for our agreement. God does not need a group of people to say how. He just is looking for a group of people that will say yes. That's it. 
And our job, your job, as being a part of this body, every member realizing that they're a significant member, right? Everybody being a part of this body. Our job, when your leaders release vision, is not to assess it, is not to process it, is not to limit ourselves to a cognitive process. Our job is to simply say, yes, so be it. I'm in agreement. Amen. I'm in alignment with what's being released. Why is this so significant? Because the Bible says that all of God's promises are yes in Christ Jesus. Wait. Everything he's promised you, he's already said yes to? Is that crazy? Do you realize, like, why do we act like God's pondering his promises for his people? Everything God's promised you, your legacy, your destiny, your family, your future, as Pastor Sam would say, your children, your children's children, your children's 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 children, every single one of them, I just had to throw that in because he's not here and he wanted to be here. Every single one of those promises, he's already said yes to. But there's a caveat. It says all of God's promises are yes in Christ Jesus and are amen. Which means God can't release what we don't agree with. So he's just looking. Why have you seen all that you've seen? Because you've already been a group of people that have simply said yes. But now it's about to get crazy. Like if you thought this was crazy, now it's about to get a million people? Who would just, a revival out of Perth? What? A young generation? Like, are you kidding me? Like, now it's going to get crazy. This is, now your faith is actually going to be tested slash trusted. So looking for a group of people to simply say yes. Let me give you a practical application. Take the words that have been said. Write them down somewhere you can see them. Every Only do this if you want revival. Only do this if you want breakthrough. Only do this if you want your city saved, your nation saved. The world. Only do it for that. If you don't want that, then don't do it. But if you want that, write everything down that God has been saying, and simply say, I changed my towel, I love you. (laughs) I wanted his sweat on my brow, there's an anointing on it. It robbed me of my blessing. It's simply, yes, is there a yes? Is there a, is there a yes in the house? So significant because you've entered into a new era. Globally, the church entered into a new era a few years ago by my timeline. But this church, its personal mandate within the global mandate has just entered into a new era. And as you know, you've probably heard this before, an era is not something you have a reference point for. I didn't say a new season. See, seasons is something we've experienced. Seasons does represent a shift, and seasons do represent a change, but it also represents a reference point. We can point back to summer. We can point back to winter. We know the drinks we like to drink in wintertime and the outfits we like to wear and the fireplace we like to sit by. We know the, you know, the shorts we put on in the summer. We know the weather. We know the sunburn we're going to have. We have a reference point for seasons, but we do not have a reference point for eras. which means as a church, I mean, that's what this week has been. God has been birthing birthing a new era of ministry for Kingdom City. I'm glad seven of you don't, I mean, you don't golf clap, and I had seven. Oh, yay, great, great. Amen, amen, yes, Lord, amen, amen, amen. It's a new, yes, 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 yes. Yes. He's crazy. No, he's crazy. Oh. Stop. If, if Pastor Jemima doesn't take his mic and break it. She tried. It's a new era. It's a new era. It's a new era. A new dispensation of how God wants to move in and through humanity. Greater miracles, greater glory. I I said this in Malaysia, and obviously everything released there is for here. There's going to be people that get healed walking towards the building. There's going to be people, that's what we're, there's going to get people getting saved before the altar call. Because there's such a spirit of purity in this house, there'll be people that fall to their knees and begin to weep because they it's the response, what must I do to be saved? You can have people looking at you, you just be sharing what God's doing, and they don't, what must I do to have that? What must I do to look like that? Must, what, what, what must I do? It's the foundation for the message today as we end John chapter 2. You with me? 
I'm going to be reading from the Never Incorrect Version again. Such an honor. It says, on the third day of the wedding, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' his mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' his mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, first of all, husband, that's never appropriate. <laughs> or boyfriend, or son. He just, it just d- doesn't work at all, unless you want a good old assemblies of God spanking, right? Just... I grew up getting hit by the church belt. That was an inside joke. <laughs> Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I love Jesus' mom. She's like, Woman, my hour is not time. She goes, it might be God, but I'm still your mom. Do whatever he tells you. <laughs> Ain't that right? And all the moms said, Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom inside and said, hey. Everybody brings out the choice wine first and the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, a.k.a. they're inebriated. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. If you're taking notes today, the the title of our closing conference message, uh, subject matter of the few moments we're going to share together is go get some water. Go get some water. Touch two to three people gently and holily and just say quickly, go get some water. Go get some water. Go get, go get, go get, go get, go get, go get, go get. Go get some water. Go get some water. You know, as God gave me this message earlier in this year, he really did, and I've actually only been released it now. I've released it into Malaysia, but I got it in the beginning of this year, and I haven't been able to preach it. I've only was able to preach it at two other churches that are actually experiencing smaller versions of this, but I would say legitimate outpourings of what God's doing on the planet. And I've been waiting. Trust me, I love the message. I, I feel good about the message, but there's not been soil worthy of the seed. I have not been able to preach it. I actually talked to Pastor Mark a few months ago, and I said, I'm so excited to come because I really believe this message is for you, and I haven't been able to preach it. And I've, I've traveled every week. I've been in conferences everywhere, and I'm like, I can't get this message out. And I honestly believe now when I got here, God gave me the message for this house, and he allowed me to practice it the few times I preached it. So this is not like Jedediah's that, you know, his closing conference message. This is not like the go-to. It's not the, this is like brand new, fresh rhema. This is, this is basically a big old gathering meeting. This is a family gathering, and, and I really feel this is what God's prophetic word is for the, the house right now and for what was, what is, and what will be next. And it's, it's, a, it's a story most of us know. If you're a Christ follower in here, if you, you've done church before, it's a, it's a story most of us are familiar with and we have an understanding. But if you were probably to be honest with me and I was probably to be honest with you, it's one we've often just overlooked, right? Jesus' first miracle is just kind of warming up. There's no Lazarus. There's no blind eyes. There's no miracle mud being used. There's no walking on water. There's no storm calling. It's just some water and there's some wine. It's something we just kind of move through, right? You're like, yeah, there's, this never made it to the flannel graph board in Sunday school. Like I never saw them like, you know, lining up the, it was just like, yeah, Jesus, he's, he's kind of stepping into his ministry. It's a warm-up miracle. But if you understand who God is, there's a a theological disposition called the, the law of first mention. The law of first mention says that anytime God is going to introduce something into scripture for the first time, anytime he's beginning to give an idea, a, 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 a new doctrine, a new concept, anytime God begins to introduce something into scripture, it's first time, that means it's in its simplest form, its clearest form, and that is the design of God's model. For example, if you were to try to understand the identity of humanity, you could not study it in the New Testament. There's aspects about your image. There's aspects about your authority. There's aspects about your power in the New Testament. But for you to really understand God's model, you have to go all the way back to the beginning because this is the first time he created you. 
And, and to understand how significant it is, think about what happens in creation. God begins to take the fabric of the world that the devil could do nothing with. He begins to take the dirt, right? The devil does nothing with the dirt, can't change the dirt. He builds no trees, builds no mountains. The devil has no creative ability. He can't create anything. He can't produce anything. He can only distort what's already been created. So God begins to take the very fabric of, fabric of the world that the, the devil could do nothing with, and he begins to form this dirt into man, into woman, and he breathes on it. And then he says, let us make the dirt like us. Which means your image alone, just want to know how significant it is, how powerful it is if you go to law first mention, your image alone is a reminder to the enemy of his greatest defeat. Because the devil fell because he says, I want to be like God. That word be like means carry the image of, resemble God. He wanted to be like God, and the devil gets sent to the earth, not for paradise, but for punishment. Make no mistake, this is his prison. This is the last stage of his punishment. Do not be screwed on what's actually taking place here. The devil can't handle the planet because it reminds him of everything he could not do unless God was involved. And then God actually marks you with his image, which means when you wake up on your worst day, your bad day, it's an ugly face day, and you drag yourself out of bed and you feel defeated, you feel like you have no authority, you feel like you have no power, you feel like you're not more than a conqueror, your face alone is a reminder to the enemy that he already lost the battle. Because the thing he wanted to be like, the thing that he wanted to look like, you look like on your worst day, your dumb day, your horrible, your face alone. Then he breathes into us. Think about it. Which means that the, the breath of God creates the voice of man. Which is why he says your words create worlds. Because when you actually speak, you're carrying the very breath, the essence of God to clarify what the world should look like. Amen. This is all for fun and for free. Malaysia didn't even get this. It just shows if you want to study your identity, go back to how God originally created you before the fall of man. You're going to understand what you look like. You're going to send the authority you have, and you're going to send the power of your voice, which is why when the enemy wants to defeat a Christian, what does he do? He first attacks your identity. Then he attacks your voice. Then he attacks your authority. If you want to know what the church is missing, it's missing its identity. It's missing its authority, and it's missing its prophetic voice to declare what our world should actually be. So the law of first mention is quite significant. Would you agree? So Jesus is showing up, and he's showing up not to continue an existing religion, but to establish a kingdom. He's not showing up to take sides. He's showing up to take over. And as he shows up, he's about to walk into this new era of ministry, and he's going to release as fully God and fully man his first miracle. It's quite significant. So nothing in this story, nothing in the room in this moment is there by accident. It starts off with... Jesus at a party, point one, understanding this new era. Jesus likes to party. And all the young people said, Jesus. It's like, that's point one. Jesus likes to party. No, what's the real point? If Jesus isn't there, Jesus isn't there. Jesus isn't at the party then Jesus isn't at the party. You'll be Jedediah, you're like, you got to do better than that, man. You, did, did, you, did you see Dr. Sammy last night? I mean, did you, did you see what just Dr. Sammy, you got to do, well, this is what I'm really trying to say, that what we avoid, the enemy invades. That what we avoid as believers, the enemy invades. See, if Jesus isn't in the room, then the presence of Jesus does not exist in that place. So often as believers, we're actually avoiding where God has called us to. And then we're sitting there saying, well, we don't want to go there. Why? Because it's dark there. Because it's depressed there. Because Aunt Cheryl's going to drink a little too much, and then there's going to be F-bombs. And oh, no, I can't walk into that room. There's the smell of cigarettes. Do you want to smell like hell in heaven? I mean, that's the... <laughs> Let's be honest. We've done this. So we literally sit there and go, that's dark, that's dark, dark, dark. Listen, darkness does not overshadow light. Darkness is just the absence of light, which means if it's dark there, it's just simply because you're not there. Uh, if it's dark in politics, the church isn't in politics. If it's dark in the educational system, the church isn't in education. If it's dark in the casino, it's just because the church isn't there. This is why we have to shift in this new paradigm of not simply coming to church because if church is something we come to, it's something we leave. If church has just been something you come to, then it's just something you leave. 
then the church simply just becomes one of the many things you do in life. I come to church, what do you do on Sundays? I go to church and I leave church. And then I go to work and I leave work. And then I go to the footy and then I leave the footy. And then I go shopping, I leave shopping. I go to the mall. I leave. It's just one of the many things you do in life. But when you actually don't just come to church, but you become the church, then everything you do in life, you do as the church. Which means you're not a, which means you're not a teacher who teaches five days a week. So then you can come and serve on Sunday and be a part of the church. It's actually the church that's doing the teaching. Which means you're not a stay-at-home mom. Come on, somebody, and let's celebrate all of our stay-at-home moms. They're absolute heroes. You're a hero. Are you kidding me? You're not just stuck at home, and then you get to come to church on Sunday. No, you're stuck at church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it's actually the church that's raising a family that's raising a generation. You're not an entrepreneur in this room, an, an intellectual in the sphere of business, who actually runs a business simply so you can bring your tithe. No, it's the church that's doing the business, which is why as, as best practices for those that are Christians in business, our business should be better than everyone else's. There should be excellence in our evangelism. You can't sell a piece of crap, put a fish sticker on it, and call it holy. I don't know if that's a bad word, but it felt good for me. I just had to get it out. I just told you I just got saved two weeks ago. I just don't believe that when Christ was hanging on the cross after being whipped violently for 39 times, being spit on, mocked, beaten, and abused, hanging naked for everyone to see, and looking at his father saying, why have you forsaken me, that his vision was 75 minutes on Sunday. He did not die so that we could come to church. He died so that we could become the church, which means if I know the, I know the, the chairs are set up right, right, for function, but if it was for revelation, they would all be facing the door. If, if we actually had a revelation of what's happening, it's the chair should be turned around facing the door, facing the world, which means none of these words make sense unless they're lived with the world in mind. So if you actually just go in on a Sunday and receive and then leave, you've missed the whole point of why Christ died. It's, it, that's why this is the, you know what's happening every Sunday? The equipping of the saints. So that you could go do the work of the ministry. Every Sunday is a commissioning service. So you were saying, well, isn't this church? No, this is gathering as the church. You're the church. This is the gathering as the church. So Jesus likes to party because if he wasn't there, this moment would not have happened. Verse 3 of John 2. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman. Why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Have you ever wondered why Jesus turned the water into wine after he told his mother, my hour has not come? Was he lying? Have you? Because there's two, you're actually going to see two parts of the Old Testament lifestyle and the New Testament lifestyle right in this, in this verse. She first shows up to Jesus and says, we out of wine, which is, in essence, saying, look at our need. Jesus responds, the need is, my hour has not come. And then she turns around and says, do whatever he tells you. What's the difference? That's a need statement. This is a faith statement. Jesus, look at my need. I don't have time for that. That's OT. But, but, but I want it now. Do whatever he tells you. Look at my faith. What's the lesson for us in this new ever ministry? God doesn't respond to needs. He responds to faith. God knows your need. He respects your need. He wants to meet your need. He can supply all that you need. But our God responds to faith. If God responded to need, we would have revival in the poorest cities of the world. There would be outbreaks in the slums of New York and, and different parts of the U.S. And you'd go to the poorest, most, you know, the, the greatest forms of depravity of humanity in parts of Africa. And the spirit would have to respond to need. But God doesn't respond to need he responds to faith we need a generation that stops pleading and begging and starts declaring and demanding we need some people that will stand up prophetically and say i am healed he will be saved that school will be changed this city will be reformed our nation will be under god as you heard earlier we have to protect our words god's not looking for a people full of need he's looking for a people that are full of faith come on give him a shout of praise today And then in verse 6, it says, Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now, when I first read this story, I constantly thought that 
these things had no significance. Sorry, I'm just setting up my props here. You guys did great. These things have no significance. Like, what's the point? But I realized that if Jesus is going to do his first miracle, he's pointing to something in every aspect of this verse. So significant that there's six, not five, not eight, not ten, not twelve. There's six ceremonial basins that are sitting here. Six is actually the number for man. It represents man's shortcomings and man's fall. So as he's standing in the middle of a new covenant, which, by the way, why is this miracle taking place at a wedding? Because the Old Testament was identified by the covenant God made with man. So a covenant that was broken by man, he's about to reinstitute as man and God. So it has to start at a wedding because a wedding is a place of covenant, the institution that God created for a miracle. Think about it this way. This is so good, which is why you can't just come to church, you're called to church, which means if you're called to this church, you're in covenant with this church. Of God's model for reproduction was the divine union of marriage, right? He has no other model. His model, he goes, this is the best practice. It's that you're married when you have sex. And if you're married and you have sex and you come on somebody, you can, someone's like, sex, he said the word. (laughs) It's okay, young people, wait till you're married. If you're married when you have sex, then that means the only place that reproduction can take place is through covenant. The only place, and what happens if you actually give birth to something without a covenant? It's actually considered illegitimate. So often in the church world, we're, we're going to churches without identifying covenant, giving birth to a ministry, giving birth to an idea, and then that idea is actually illegitimate, and people are now fighting whose idea was that, whose song was that, whose campus was that, right, because they didn't understand and establish covenant. So covenant in God's mind is the place of the reproductive miracle. So he says, God, and, and what's the greater miracle? Is it the cross or is God's covenant with creation? Because when God created a covenant with creation, he confined himself to it. And at that moment, the cross was immediately erected. Because he said, in covenant, I will never break it. So if you break it, I'm going to have to restore it through my son on the cross. So the moment he created us, he confined himself to us through covenant. And instantly, he built a cross for his son to die on hundreds of thousands of years later. So he takes, sorry, I hope that makes sense for some of you. So he starts at a wedding place of covenant. There's six ceremonial basins. Six is the number of man. It represents man's shortcomings and man's imperfection. So six actually represents the number of man's fall, which produced sin, which produced the law. So that segues to why there's the ceremonial basins. The ceremonial basins was what was used by the priest to prepare themselves to be pure before sacrifice. Trust me, there's a revelation here, so stay with me. I know it's deep. I mean, this is what Jesus is doing. Six, number of man, represents sin, represents the fall, introduces the law, the ceremonial basins. Now, what do we know about the law? The law produced sacrifice that never equaled a celebration. Here's why. Every year, it says that they would actually bring their sacrifices to the priests, and it did not remove judgment, it just postponed it. So I have a four-year-old son who does get spanked. It's holy. And he's far from God. He's not saved yet. We're praying for him this week. And um, if I tell Dalen, hey, Dalen, you're in trouble. We're at the mall. I'm going to have to spank you now, 20 minutes later. He doesn't get excited. He's not celebrating. Because he's still going to get spanked. Just not right now. That's the simplest version of the law. (laughs) Guess what? You're not going to get spanked now, but you're going to get spanked later. And and like the people aren't like, yay! Right? It's like, oh, next year i got to kill more things to delay punishment, right? Which means the ceremonial and the rituals of the Old Testament never produce pure joy. So Jesus is about to show up. Here's what's so beautiful about it. He's gonna say, hey, what was once a ritual of sacrifice will now be a relationship of celebration. Because what man could not do, I will do, and I will remove the sins of mankind once and for all, forever and all time. Come on, somebody. So, so this, is, uh, this is where it, it gets good because I was talking to a rabbi. I did bring a rabbi into this to get some clear understanding of what was happening in this prize. So I see these ceremonial basins in there, and I said, um, so are you telling me that 
um, these ceremony basins would have been used throughout the entire wedding. And, you know, because he starts telling me, hey, in the Jewish home, you know, through all of these different feasts and celebrations, they would have moments where they'd have to wash their hands depending on the feast. They'd have to wash their heads. Sometimes they'd have to wash their whole bodies. So, like, the wedding would have had people using these ceremonial basins throughout the entire time. So I said, were these the ceremony basins used throughout the wedding? And then he said these words. He said, no, Jedediah, you don't understand. For what Jesus was about to do, he couldn't use what had already been used. He couldn't have used the same ceremony of basins because that would have been used for a different celebration. These would have had to have been empty basins, vessels. And I go, why were they there? And he goes, well, every good servant, if they were a good servant in a Jewish home, would prepare in advance unused vessels just in case God wanted to use them or the master wanted to use them. He said, for these to be sitting in the room, for God to do the miracle, for Jesus to do his first miracle, these would have been prepared in advance unused just in case the master was going to use them. Friend, can I ask you something? When it comes to your life, have you prepared an unused vessel in advance just in case the master wanted to use you? When it comes to your quiet time, have you prepared some space in your day called quiet time, unused, prepared in advance, just in case God wanted to speak, just in case God wanted to show up? When it comes to your finances, do you have a just in case account prepared in advance, unused, just in case God said it's time to plant another campus, just in case said it's time to bless that initiative? Have you prepared in home just an unused space just in case God wanted you to host a connect group? God wanted you to provide some space in your home for people to encounter God in a new way. When it comes to your attitude or your language, do you have any margin prepared in advance just in case God wanted to show up? Do you know why we're all here today? Because you had some leaders that prepared in advance unused space just in case God wanted to show up. What do you think KL is? What do you think Perth is? What do you think London is? What do you think Phnom Penh is? Come on, somebody. What do you think Singapore? You know what it was? You know what's happening this Sunday? JB, KK, Kunching. Paying not, what is it, a bunch of unused, just in case, prepared in advance. God wanted to touch a city. God wanted to restore a family. God wanted to bring revival or something. It's just unused, just in case. So significant that they were here because God is the divine steward, which means he can't pour out what can be contained. Because he won't waste it. You don't believe me? Look at the Bible. You know the story in 2 Kings. It's chapter 4. There's a widow. Elijah shows up and um, he, he tells her, hey, um, I, I know you only have a little bit of oil, but can you go throughout your city, talk to your friends, your family, and can you just grab some unused, prepared in advance vessels just in case I was going to pour out supernatural abundance? And you know the story, right? She's grabbing all these vessels. She's grabbing everything she needs. She's, she's bringing it all together. And, and this is the tragedy of the story because she's filling one, filling one, filling one, filling one. You know the story, right? Oil's pouring, oil's pouring, oil's pouring. And then we get to verse six. It says, when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing which means if there was another jar, there would be more oil, which means if there's another jar, there would have been more oil, which means if there's another jar, there would have been more anointing, there would have been more power, there would have been more blessing, they would have been, is, is maybe the limit of God in our world the limit of God in our life? The only, I'm just going to tell this, the only time what God's doing here will ever stop is when you stop preparing unused vessels just in case. God's going, what's that investment? That's an unused vessel. What's that business? An unused vessel. What's that life? An unused vessel. What's your home? An unused vessel. What's your business? An unused vessel. What's your family? An unused vessel just in case because God won't pour out what can't be stewarded. How do we know this? Look at the, the miracle that Dr. Maiden just shared about. There's two miracles. There's the miracle of the multiplication of the bread and the loaves to feed 5,000 people with a filet of fish Happy Meal, right? But then there's a supernatural miracle of God creating 12 baskets that didn't exist. Here's what's crazy. If you were here yesterday, 12, the number of divine government, which means abundance flows to divine government. Of God's established, his house is moving in, I'm just telling you prophetically, supernatural abundance because abundance flows to divine government. 
which means God wouldn't do an abundant miracle if there wasn't a vessel to steward what he was about to be released. Come on, that's better than you're responding this morning. So as I was, I was talking to this, this rabbi, which is super significant, this rabbi is brilliant and he's walking through it and I'm talking to him about this next part of the verse, verse seven, it says, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. You can get the keys up to make this a little more anointing. So I started talking to this, I started talking to this rabbi and I said, um, you know, so when they're filling the jars of water, you know, where was the water at? And he goes, no, Jedediah, you, you don't understand that these wouldn't have been previously filled with water. So significant. He said, because for a ceremonial basin for this part of this process, it couldn't be sitting water because sitting water is stagnant water in Jewish custom. Could it be, friend, that God doesn't use sitting Christians? Stagnant Christians? Could God just use standing Christians? So you got to know, the enemy is not freaked out about what, he's hearing all the words. You're hearing it, but so is the enemy. But he's not freaking out as long as it's in this room. He does not care about how many people attend church on Sunday, just so you know. He's not freaking out. Oh, my God, they got thousands of people there. There's a million of people in a Oh, my goodness, there's so, many, there's so many people in churches right now. He does not care. If they're sitting, it does not matter. But the moment they stop sitting on Sunday and start standing on Monday and preaching on Tuesday and praising on Wednesday and evangelizing on Thursday and still being the church on Friday and bringing heaven to earth on Saturday, the moment you leave this room and become the church, look out, devil, we're about to change. Come on. We're about to change the world. He says, Jedediah, it, can't be, it couldn't be sitting water. And in fact, then he said this, the water's not even in the house. He goes, the water used for ceremonial basins would be identified throughout the city. They would have been pure sources of water, hear me, that have a consistent flow. That's why it's so significant, friend, to not live off of yesterday's rhema or yesterday's truth. We need mercies new every morning. We need a new truth every single day. We need God to continue to flow in us and through us. And what happens? The moment what flows in us does not come out of us, instead of being a river, we become a swamp. And what was fresh now is stale and stinks because it's supposed to not come in you, it's supposed to flow through you. So I said to him, so you telling me they had to leave the house? And he goes, oh yeah, they could not have filled these with water in the house. And he said, and in fact, there wouldn't have been the systems in the house for water to flow. They'd have to leave the cities. So are you telling me that they had to leave to go get the water Jesus asked? Did they had to, That they couldn't just fill it in the house? That they had a... It's about to get wet up here. Have you ever asked God for wine and he told you to go get water? Have you ever asked God for a spouse and he told you to take a sabbatical from dating? Let's make it practical. Have you ever asked God for a promotion? And he said, could you just be a carrier? Have you ever asked God to bless your house? And he told you to start a connect group? Have you ever asked God for a miracle? And then he told you to do the mundane? Have you said, God, please bust me? And he said, could you just give above and beyond your tithe? Have you ever asked God to give you your promise? And he said, would you just complete your process? Come on, somebody. Have you ever asked God for wine? And he told you to go get some water? What does it look like? This is, 
This is what this is the picture of this church. How many trips did they have to take? How many steps did it take? How, how, how many people were helping? Because if there's just one carrier, uh, if there's just two carriers, I got to fill them all the way and fill them to the brim. I mean, how long would it take for God to do the miracle if there's just one carrier? How long would it take for God to do the miracle if there's just two carriers? How long would it take for God to do the miracle? Because God doesn't do the miracle on the first step. I mean, it would be awesome, right? We start tithing tomorrow, we hit the lotto. It'd be awesome. We share one message and suddenly we're booked with Sammy Rodriguez. It would be awesome if someone saw our, right? It wouldn't just be awesome if, if God did, but they're walking and guess what? I, I know, I know he said it's gonna be wine, but all I see is water. See, I can't allow what I see to dictate what God said. And, and as I'm walking, I know that my God is working. Come on, has anyone ever been here before? God, I'm praying, where's the breakthrough? God, I'm serving, where's the promotion? God, I'm loving her despite of her, but guess what, she's not loving me. God, I'm trying to be a light, but my family's still not saved. God, I'm trying to build a household, but I still got a prodigal. God, I know what you, I know what you said, but I'm so focused on what I see. God, I need some wine, well go get some water. And if I'm gonna have to leave, so go get water. Why can't I just go get wine? Because anybody can go get wine. Anybody. Kingdom City, God doesn't want to give you wine. He wants to give you a miracle. Anybody can just go buy a building. Anybody can just go and Have you ever wondered why it took so long? Have you ever wondered why it was difficult? Because we have a God that does not do the normal. He only does the impossible. He's not interested in your possible. He's not interested in what you can do. He's made it difficult. There is opposition. There is a trial. Because without a trial, there's no triumph. Without a battle, there's no victory. Without taking the steps of faith, there's no God giving an outbreak of the miraculous. Who's here right now? Who's here right now? Just, you want to know why we're going to have a million people? You want to know why? Because we have a bunch of carriers that just won't stop getting water. They won't. I might not get credit. I might not get seen, but guess what? God's blessed you so much, he's allowed you to grab a bucket and be a part of the miracle. You wanna know, you wanna know the secret to Kingdom City? Hundreds of carriers, thousands of carriers, grabbing buckets, getting water, staying faithful, serving, loving, giving, believing, fighting, praying, sun up, sun down, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, regardless of what it looks like, regardless of what the world says, regardless if it's attractive, regardless if it's popular, regardless if it seems significant, because I know that while I'm walking, God's working, and while I'm wor worshiping, God's working. And I don't know when revival is going to take place. I don't know when he's going to come back. I don't know when Australia is going to be saved. But I just know what he said. Go get some water. I came thousands of miles to tell a church that's become a movement, don't stop getting water. Don't stop getting water. Don't stop getting water. But we gotta fill them to the brim. Which means, guess what? There's five campuses launched this week. How many carriers do we need? There's Indonesia right in front of us. How many carriers do we need? We need so, why? Because the miracle doesn't happen on our first step. See, so often we think the miracle is gonna happen on our first step of obedience. Not realizing that it doesn't happen till our last step of obedience. 
See, some of you are in here saying God hasn't done it yet. It's because you're not done doing what he said to do. Have you obeyed him fully? I would love it too, friend, if he did the miracle the first time I prayed, the first time I asked, the first time I sold, the first time I surrendered. But these miracles don't happen on the first step. They happen on the, the last step. Look at this verse. First day, stay standing. If you're not, we're about to end. If you can, capable. Oh, you are standing, Pastor Sammy. Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Could it be? I'm just telling you. That's why I love, this is what's so significant about your leaders. I'm just telling you, here's part of the secret, Pastor Mark and Jemima, is that you announce Indonesia on when, you conclude it on Wednesday, Wednesday and you announce it on the conference on Monday. You know what they do? Risk. Not foolish risk, spiritual risk. Because when does this miracle happen? When does the water turn into wine? When? Was it when the buckets were filled? No. It says draw some water out. Bring it to the master. Now I'm, see, it's one thing. Some of us are actually comfortable staying private with our faith and serving. And it's amazing. But he's taking what's been done privately. God's about to take it publicly. Did you hear me? Did you hear me, Kingdom City? What you've been doing 12 years in private, God's about to put on display for the next 12 years in public. Take it to the master. Could it be that our miracle only exists beyond our risk? Because while you're getting water, there's no criticism. But the moment you bring it to the master's lips, the moment you bring it to your neighbor, the moment you bring it to your job, the moment you bring it to your high school, the moment you bring it to your university, the moment you say, taste, taste. It's the moment you risk everything. Taste. Could it have been that it wasn't now, in this moment of exchange, the place of risk that the miracle took place? Can I tell you something? God's given you permission to risk Kingdom City. And there's people waiting to taste the wine that was once water. The empty vessel that you were, that God's poured out his spirit, his power, his presence. They're waiting to, that's why the Bible says, taste and see. We're trying to say, see without tasting. Tasting. I love this part of the verse. Jesus. Jesus. It says he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. See, there's... You've heard this is what's so great. You know what we've been saying? You know what we've been saying, Dr. Maiden, Reverend Sammy, and me? This wine's crazy. This is like unbelievable wine. What does it say? Did I realize? But the servant said, draw on the water new. We're like drinking the wine that was once your water. We're going, this is unbelievable. You know what Pastor Mark and Jemima are saying? You, you know what they're saying? You, you're drinking some great wine, but guess what? We know it was just a bunch of water. People are going to come in from all over the world. People are going to come in from all over the world to study the model, to watch what's happening, to figure out how God's doing it. They're going to be walking in and go, oh, my God, look at revival. Look at the outbreak. Look at the outpouring. Look at the overflow. How is God doing this? How is it happening? And we're going to all look at each other and go, they don't know. But it was just thousands of carriers continuing to be faithful, to continue to get water. It, it looks like a miracle, but we know it was once mundane. This looks so supernatural, but we know it was once so super practical why is the wine so good because we have some carriers who just didn't stop I'm just you 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 just already heard it there's gonna be people in the stadium filled people are gonna be like what have you been doing 
we're all going to look at each other because this is still early. I like to be an early investor. I was here a few years ago. I like to be woven into the previous 12 years. Come on, somebody. I was an early investor. Remember, I was here. I called you the best kept global secret. So when it's not a secret, remember Jedediah when I was like, doo, 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 like I was blowing the trumpet around the world. Come on, somebody. People are going to be flying. The greatest leaders on the planet. Are you hearing me? We're all going to be like, you don't know. We once did two conferences in two cities, and there was only 3,000 at each. Only 3,000 at each. <laughs> only 6,000 people. And we're going to be like, you don't even know when there's 60,000, when there's 100,000, when there's 250,000, when there's half a million, when there's a million people. We're all going to know why, because we just... It was just a coffee date. It was just four people. It was just one campus. It was just taking on another church. It was just, you don't know what the journey has been. It's just been faithful, servants, humble, healthy, happy, healed. Huh, are you hearing me? We're ending, we're ending, we're ending, we're ending. We're ending. It's such a prophetic declaration. John 2, it says, then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you've saved the best wine till now. In the wine world, people always think the best wine's the oldest wine. That's just a miscon you know, misconstrued idea. They think like, oh, it's, it's age. No, the, the best wine, if you, if you have any friends that own vineyards, I have extended in-laws that actually own multiple vineyards. The best wine is the wine that's ready to be drinking now. It's not about age. It's not about price. It's about wine that's ready. So people will say, if they're, if they're a wine connoisseur, they'll say, you need to drink this in the next few months. That's the timeline to drink it. It's best now. See, what's so beautiful about your leaders is that they're not trying to just store wine and, and, and conserve wine. They're, they're drinking the wine that's ready to be drinking now. So one day it's prophetic, one day it's apostolic, one day it's evangelism, one day it's discipleship, one day it's teaching. They're not limited to like, oh, this is the, I've saved this one bottle. No, no, no. It's, what's God doing now? Oh, wait, we'll take that. What's God releasing on the planet now? Oh, we'll take it. Oh, wait, it's stadium Christianity? Oh, we'll take it. Oh, it's taking nations? We'll take it. Oh, now it's this move? We'll take it. They're not picking one thing because it's never been for them about taste. It's always been about fruit. Okay, I'm ending. It says, what Jesus did here, this is the whole point of the water on the floor, the buckets walking, the sweating, the yelling, the screaming, the awkward American. It says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. This is the church, I'm telling you. You are a people that will be known for revealing God's glory that has not been revealed yet. Wow. I mean, I've just seen it so clearly all week. It's so, so you need to get this. I've seen, even as we move, Pastor Mark and Jemima, these, these last few days, it's even, it's like God's been unfolding the story, the future narrative of this church. And even as today, what I saw him is this, you know, what, what's this conference called? What's the theme? Huh. Because what I saw, forgetting the theme, because it's been so prophetic. What I saw was an open heaven. Over Perth, over KL, over Singapore, over Botswana, over London, over Phnom Penh, future new nations, Indonesia, I know you're standing. I'm almost done. Sorry, I thought it was going to be done earlier, but I'm not because God keeps talking. I apologize. Give me a few more minutes. Keep standing. 
So in open heaven, hear this, this is so good. And God, thank you, you're so good. Can't make this stuff up. That's why I'm kind of like, wow, you're crazy. It's just like, he's so much better than a preacher. So. So I saw this today. I literally go, I go, God, what is, I mean, I actually use the word. I told Dom, I told Dominic, Dominic Russo, founder of missions.me, best friend. We run the org together. I said, I've never been in a prophetic outpouring like this in my life. He's texting today. I'll show you the text. I prove I'm not lying. I'm not taking preacher's liberty. You're allowed a little room. No, this is completely within margin. <laughs> and I go, I've never been today. I've never been a part of the, I actually said, Sorry, I haven't talked to you in a week. I'm not responding to any of this stuff. I go, the pace of what God's doing here is unprecedented. I don't even have room to do mundane. That's revival. It's the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. Revival is when you don't have time for the mundane. Nothing wrong with social media, nothing wrong with vacations, no, but there's a moment when God in this unprecedented, unparalleled, unbridled moment in history just simply says, you don't have time for just the mundane things that make no difference when it comes to eternity. And I go, I have no time. I just, I don't have time for this. It's unprecedented. And then as we're in the back there, I go, you know what this is? It's an outpouring. It's not just an outpouring of the predicate. It's an outpouring of his glory. And then I saw pockets of glory over these places. Now here's what's crazy. Of God's pouring out new wine, from heaven, open heaven, new wine, new revelation, new power, new authority. You with me? Wine's just not something we drink. Come on, Aussies. You're like, oh, more wine. No. <laughs> Sorry. And that got me. I didn't it got me. New wine. That wine goes into vessels. New wine, right? So you need room. You need everyone in here to be a vessel, to be a carrier, to grab a bucket, to go get water, to be a vessel just in case. But listen, that's not the point. He pours it out. In the New Testament, he introduces these new phrases, this new phraseology. New wine demands. Oh, you're so smart. Most intelligent crowd I've ever been in. New wine requires new wineskin, right? Wineskin was not a storage mechanism. Wine, the wineskin, look it up. Truth. This is also what the rabbi told me. I can't take credit. Wineskin was made for the traveler. So a wineskin, here's what's so good, is a mobilization method. Yeah. Hear me. You would never store wineskin at home. You would never find wine in wineskins at home. At home, it would be in vats. And then the traveler would pour out the wine coming from heaven into a wineskin so that he could take the wine with him. And that wine had a timeline that it was good. Because you could not store it, it had to be used. So if God in this prophetic narrative of how he's weaving it all together, which is crazy, if he's saying it's open heavens, which means I'm pouring out new wine, that means everyone in this room is not a vat, but a wineskin. Yeah. A wineskin. To mobilize God's glory around the planet. Why will this be a million people? You're going to keep hearing that. Why? Because we don't have a bunch of vats. We have a bunch of wineskin. So what God's poured out this week, you put it in and you just start taking it to work and taking it home. And let's get drunk on Jesus. Like we're just taking it. But for us to get there, for us to get there. For us to get there, we have to start here. With a bucket and a carrier. If I knew God was going to release this message this way, I would have bought thousands of little buckets. I'm going to give you a visual. You can draw it on a piece of paper. Thousands of little buckets with the word carrier on it. So that when you left here, you would never forget how you're going to get to where God's called you. The practical ap application of the prophetic declaration, grab a bucket, become a carrier, go get some water.